can look at it from two ways. You can look at it from uh, an individual standpoint of making uh, progress on an individual level and not trying to please everybody all of the time. Or you can self-destruct and get mad at the judges and lash out at the fans and get mad at your competitors because of your own shortcomings. You may love him or you may despise him, but if you're a bodybuilding fan, you certainly know him. Sugar Sean Ray is a name that will forever be associated with the golden era of bodybuilding. With proportions and lines reminiscent of depictions of Greek gods, Ray has more than earned his legend status. But in his ascent to the top, he's also earned a rather polarizing reputation for himself. But that's for another video. This video is on Sean's rise to bodybuilding greatness and the noise that he made in the process. This is The Complicated Legacy of Sean Ray. Before we get into his rise to the top of the bodybuilding world, it's important to examine how it all started. Born in Placenta, California in 1965 to a janitor and an accountant, Ray inherited a unique blend of blue collar work ethic and white collar business acumen. It was his father's janitorial work that encouraged him to pursue bigger and better things. Sean wasn't ashamed of his father or his profession, but helping his dad clean toilets and wash windows as a teenager gave him the motivation to dream bigger. It also helped him develop his work ethic. His father was also said to be built like a bodybuilder even though he didn't go to the gym. So, Sean had the genetic foundation in place. Like many other successful bodybuilders, Sean was a standout high school athlete who had aspirations of making it to the NFL. He got the opportunity to start on varsity as a sophomore and was the definition of a Swiss army knife. He put in work at halfback, punter, punt returner, and kick returner. In 1983, Sean set Eldorado High School's all-time rushing record and the record for the longest run from scrimmage at 98 yards, both of which still stand to this day. In 2003, his alma mater inducted him into its Football Hall of Fame and retired his number one. Suffice to say, Ray had the physical gifts and the genetic potential to step on stage and be great, and his journey to realizing that potential would start at the tender age of 17 when he would meet and begin training with IFBB hopeful John Brown. Okay, look at this guy. If he trained at my gym, I'd want to hit chest and shoulders with him every week. But those sessions wouldn't be easy, as according to Sean, he threw up and quit more in six months training with John than he had at any other given time. Fun fact for my football fans watching, John Brown is the father of these guys. The lesser known football version of the Ball Brothers and Amon Ra just finished a fantastic season with the Lions, so good for him. Go Amon Ra. Back to Sean. John Brown's tutelage and mentorship was instrumental in helping him realize his potential as a bodybuilder. John Brown. Without John, I wouldn't be here. Just like without Joe Weider, John was the one that showed me that the hard work in the gym is where the money comes through the bank. Being a shorter guy at five foot six, Sean had seen Chris Dickerson and Samir Banu win the Olympia in 82 and 83, respectively. And with those guys being around the same height as him, he had all the validation he needed to believe that he could accomplish the same thing. Not to mention, many of the biggest names in bodybuilding like Franco Colombo, Lee Labrada, Mojave McAwee, were all shorter competitors. Having been a teenager with genetics so precocious that he was constantly being confused for a bodybuilder, Sean figured he would actually give it a shot. Having John Brown in his ear and building his confidence Sean developed the motivation to take up his new hobby, and within six months of taking his training seriously, he stepped on stage for the first time. When he saw me, he thought I was already training for bodybuilding, but I was training for football. Six months later, I was on stage, then I was his full-time training partner for a year. In 1983, he competed in his first two amateur shows, the Orange Coast Championships, where he took second in the short division. A little demeaning, I might add. I like vertically challenged, but that's just me. He also won the California Gold Cup where he placed first overall. Extremely impressive for an 18-year-old senior in high school. According to Sean, it was then that he knew he would become a bodybuilder. In that very same scholastic year, Sean got injured and was sidelined most of his senior season. As the summer of 84 fast approached, Sean had to make the decision between competing in the All-Star football game or the Teenage Nationals, 
both of which were taking place in June. Well, we can make a pretty good guess as to which route Sean decided to take. Sean placed second at the Teenage Nationals that year, along with the overall win at the Mr. T in Los Angeles. Sean was cementing himself as a teenage phenom, beating men much older than him in arguably the most competitive era of bodybuilding. Sean was a rising star, and he knew it. In 1985, he had his best year as an amateur, going undefeated and winning the overall at his three competitions, one of them being the same teenage national show he competed in the year prior. That victory got him his first Flex magazine cover and the attention of Joe and Ben Leader, founders of the IFBB and creators of the Super Bowl of Bodybuilding, the Mr. Olympia. The other big show he won that year was the Junior World Championship, which got him on the cover of Flex magazine again. So just to make sure we're on the same page so far, this guy's been on the cover of Flex magazine twice and he's not even a pro yet. In his entire amateur career, his lowest placing was third place. Yeah, dude competed in 12 amateur shows and placed outside of the top two once. To put that into perspective, Ray competed in more amateur shows over the course of his four-year amateur career than his contemporaries Kevin Lebroni and Dorian Yates combined. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that Sean was a better bodybuilder than these guys as an amateur, but I'm just using this statistic to illustrate his impressive resume as an up-and-comer. Anybody who's ever competed knows that bringing your best to three shows a year can be pretty difficult, and placing top two in 11 of 12 shows is a pretty damn incredible feat to accomplish in your early 20s. These accomplishments didn't go unnoticed. In 1986, at 21 years of age, Sean signed his first bodybuilding contract with the leaders, making him $1,000 a month, which would be worth approximately $2,536 today, accounting for inflation. High school a professional and Joe Weider signed me my first $1,000 a month contract. $1,000 a month. $700 apartment, $289 car payment. I had to figure the rest out. It was sink or swim. According to Sean, Joe Weider saw something in him that even he didn't see in himself. See, the purpose of this background information is to set the psychological context for what will become Sean Ray's mentality as he rises to the top of the bodybuilding world. Picture this for a second. You develop a passion as a teenager. You work towards that passion with a level of discipline that most kids your age just don't have. Within four years, you've been designated a professional in your field and have graced the cover of the biggest magazine in your field twice and signed your first professional contract. And at that point, you're only 22. It would be a perfectly rational assumption to say that someone who's achieved that level of success at such a young age could be left susceptible to extremely high expectations and even a high sense of self-importance. And as a guy who hadn't even reached his prime, Sean was that dude. And again, he knew it. Sean's entire pro career would be filled with obstacles he would have to overcome as well as an increasing frustration with his organization that would eventually reach a boiling point. After competing at his first pro show at the 1988 Olympia, Sean agreed to compete in the inaugural Arnold Classic in 1989. Five weeks prior to that show, Sean had gotten injured. This began his tumultuous relationship with then IFBB president Wayne D'Amelio, who despite Sean's injury demanded that he fulfill his contractual obligations by guest posing which he refused. The problem with Wayne's request was that Sean had orders from his doctor along with documentation that validated his medical exemption from competing at that show. Regardless of that, he was still asked to pay $5,000, which he refused to do. This led to a one-year suspension. Sean didn't feel like he needed to acquiesce to Wayne's demands because Joe Weider signed his checks, not Wayne. He had a relationship with Joe Weider, not Wayne. So Sean wasn't afraid to advocate for himself, nor was he afraid to push Wayne's button at any given moment. And self-admittedly, Sean would do exactly that. Sean's young pro career was already getting off to a less than ideal start. This suspension was seen as Wayne D'Amelio flexing his metaphorical muscle on Ray and all the other competitors just because he could. After completing his suspension, and nabbing his first pro victory at the inaugural Ironman Pro Championship in 1990, Sean had all the momentum in the world, heading into the 1990 Arnold Classic. Now let's just say, man did not disappoint. 
The package that he brought was one that announced to the entire bodybuilding world, I have arrived. His 1990 Arnold Classic package was a beautiful display of symmetry, proportion, and fullness. And he would walk away with that prize money and trophy in what was his biggest victory in just his third year as a pro. There was a little problem though. The IFBB implemented drug testing protocols for pros in an effort to clean up the sport and improve bodybuilding's image. As Lee Haney said in 1990, we want to get rid of the stigma that has surrounded bodybuilding. Well, that's a bit awkward because that stigma's only gotten worse, but I digress. Three days after the Arnold Classic, Sean and three other athletes got popped for using diuretics, which was a banned substance at the time. Now, it was kind of known that the majority of guys competing at the highest level were using diuretics. Hell, Mike Ashley, the runner-up, who ended up taking first place because of Sean's qualification, was arguably a lot drier than Sean was. Sean and the other three guys likely weren't the only ones using them. They just got caught. So it really seems like this disqualification was more of a formality than anything. Also, if everyone is taking banned substances like anabolics, which we know they were, and they were stopping early enough to pass the drug test, how natural are they really? These new drug testing protocols almost come off as a half-hearted attempt by the IFBB to create some plausible deniability regarding the anabolic use of its athletes, and also to allow bodybuilding to be taken more seriously in the eyes of the general public. In the words of Sean himself, Carl Lewis and Ben Johnson. While Carl Lewis had been tested dirty and Ben Johnson was caught, we later found out that Carl Lewis was dirty all the time. Mm -hmm. And all that shit came out after the fact. And at the end of the day, if everybody's dirty, then who's cheating? Right. Mm -hmm. That statement raises a good point in the context of bodybuilding. That disqualification put the spotlight on Sean since he was the original winner. And although not a career ending incident, it would forever be a stain on his resume and one less victory in the win column. After the disappointment of the Arnold, Sean would set his sights on the Olympia. He would make a remarkable improvement from his last Olympia placing. He went from 13th in 1988 to 3rd in 1990, two years into his pro career and he was already gunning for the crown. Sean ended 1990 on a strong note, and in 1991 came back with a vengeance and dominated the Arnold Classic without any issues. What he brought to the stage was much improved from the previous year. This set him up for a strong Olympia push. Momentum in bodybuilding is huge, and Sean had all of it heading into that year's Olympia. With Lee Haney's legendary career waning down, fans were asking themselves, will Sean be the heir to the Olympia throne? And now for the winner. And the second place goes to... Renal Gambier, and the winner is Sean Ray! I knew it, I knew it. Uh, he looks fantastic, he really deserved to win this competition, but I'm... At this point in his career, Sean was definitely living up to the hype and delivering on his potential so far, so he was in prime position to take the top spot. But unfortunately for him and the rest of the IFBB, some British guy named Dorian Yates would make sure that never happened. Across the waters over to the United Kingdom, there was a legend in the making named Dorian Yates, and he was about to come in and single-handedly change the sport of bodybuilding forever, while becoming Sean's arch rival in the process. The thing with Dorian was, nobody really knew him, and very few competitors had actually seen him compete before. This was long before social media and social media standards were set for bodybuilders. His nickname was a shadow throughout his career because he was kind of lurking in the darkness during the offseason, out of complete view of all of his competition with the exception of a few guest posts here and there. His overall progress, for the most part, was a complete mystery. I say all of that because in 1991, he came out of nowhere, and nobody was ready. The package he brought to that year's Olympia was the biggest and the driest physique the sport had arguably seen in a long time. A jaw-dropping combination of conditioning and size that would mark a pivotal moment in the direction of the sport. That year, Big Dorian Yates went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Lee Haney for the crown, who fell short to the champ. Not bad for his first Olympia appearance. 
it's safe to assume that Dorian was one of the reasons why Lee Haney didn't attempt to go for a ninth Olympia title. He did not want to risk competing against a bigger version of the kid who just gave him a run for his money. He wanted to go out on top. And that, folks, was a great legacy decision. Well, I always talk, I hadn't seen him, but I heard about him and golly man, he said, this guy's big, he got size just like you do, and da da da. So, so anyway. And then when I saw him for the first time in person, man, he was a monster. Something that I'd never seen before. In 1991, Dorian Yates pulled up to the Olympia with no name recognition and hurt a lot of feelings, especially Sean's, as he presented a new and rather large obstacle standing in Sean's path to glory. Sean fell two placings down to fifth that year. Fifth Beginning in 1992, Dorian Yates would be the one to carry the torch of dominant Olympia champions and essentially confirm the new direction that bodybuilding was going in. Big. Up until that point, aesthetics mattered, but Dorian was about to change that and effectively change the overall standard of what bodybuilding is. Think of how Steph Curry's virtually unguardable shot forced the entire NBA to shoot better. Dorian was essentially forcing everyone else to get bigger. Bodybuilding went from who had the best combination of size, symmetry, lines, proportion, fullness, conditioning, and posing, to who had the most size with the best amount of conditioning. The overall aesthetic of the classic physique, like Sean's, was now in danger. And the race to who would get the biggest, the fastest, would promote rampant anabolic use that the sport had never seen before. The pharmacology of competing was about to evolve to another level. This presented a problem for our giant killer, as he was consistently 20 to 30 pounds lighter than a lot of his competition. Not to mention, his use of anabolics was a lot more conservative than his contemporaries, only using what could get him harder and drier and not necessarily bigger. Winstrol was the only anabolic steroid Sean has publicly admitted to using never even thought about using insulin and all that stuff was come, kind of coming in the 90s. I don't want to say I got caught. I was ignorant to the idea of how long they stay in my system. I was using, I got off for three months and I tested positive. What'd you test positive for? Was this? V, the same oh. thing that Ben Johnson Yeah, that stays using. in your system. His lines and symmetry were no longer going to be enough to save him against the likes of Dorian and Kevin Lavroni, especially if the judges were going to continue to emphasize mass. See, this bigger direction was something that the judges liked hence why they crowned Dorian that year. And the fans loved it too because of what we call the freak factor, that quality in a bodybuilder that makes you marvel at the anabolic capabilities of the human body. Think Marcus Rule at the 2002 Night of Champions. After putting in the work in the off season, Sean moved up a placing at the 1992 Olympia into fourth place. Confirmation that despite his lack of size relative to the competition, the judges still liked what he was bringing to the stage. Sean got back to work in the offseason in preparation for the 93 Olympia and came into that show and moved up yet another placing, taking third place and beating Kevin Lavroni and Lee Labrada, guys who had beaten him the previous year. Sean was closing in on Dorian hard, and based on his current trajectory, he was quickly returning to top contender status for the Olympia title. Now comes 1994. Dorian at this point was a two-time Olympia champion, and as most could have predicted at the time, had been getting bigger and bigger. Sean though wasn't phased. He would come into the 1994 Olympia and present yet again his best package to date. What you're watching is in my opinion one of the greatest finals posing routines in the history of the Olympia. While posing to Jennifer Holliday's classic R&D hit, Sean delivered what can only be called pure art and poetry in motion a true display of passion that John Brown had instilled in Sean. John had taught Sean the value of posing, projecting, and accentuating his best features to beat the guys next to him, something that Sean carried with him and mastered throughout his whole career. And in 1994, it was on full display. Ugh, I mean, look at that. That's just the essence of art. The second place plaque being given by Ray Boudreau of Body Masters. These awards will be given to competitor number seven, Sean Ray. In the end, when it was time to announce the 1994 Mr. Olympia, it would be Dorian Yates' name that would be called, and he would win his third of six Olympia titles. 
This has not come without some controversy, however, as Dorian had torn his left bicep weeks before the show, and not only was it noticeable, but it took away from Dorian's physique a bit. He was also less conditioned than Sean. Overall, he was visibly off, and fans and pundits alike would wonder, is an Olympia champion with a visible injury really worthy of taking the title? The judges certainly thought so, and in crowning Dorian for the third straight year in a row, despite Sean's jaw-dropping and complete physique, they were once again confirming bodybuilding's bigger is better direction. Points in bodybuilding are calculated based on who has the least amount of flaws, and there's a very strong argument to make that Sean objectively had less flaws than Dorian, having come so close to tasting victory and losing. The fans were wondering, what was next for Sean? Could he compete with the big boys? And if he couldn't be Dorian with a visible injury, could he ever beat him? Sean, being the competitor that he is, had no choice but to get bigger, and he got to work along with the rest of the Olympia hopefuls. The size race was raging on, but Sean was still lagging behind a bit. Not having the size advantage as the other guys was proving to be an uphill battle. In 1995, Sean missed his peak, and Kevin Lavroni and Nasser El Sambadi would play second and third respectively, with Sean dropping a place into fourth. Dorian Yates would come back in 1995 very close to 100%, and he delivered arguably his best package ever and took his fourth Olympia title in the process. Fans would once again ask themselves, was Sean Ray's window closing? And did he have a place among this early breed of mass monsters? Sean, at this point in his career, was becoming more and more vocal about his views on the competition and the judging, and expressed some subtle frustration about his previous Olympia placings, heading into the 1996 Mr. Olympia. With politics being widespread in bodybuilding at the time, Sean was keeping it real, and creating a bit of a polarizing reputation for himself in the process. This is why I bodybuild for this one moment in time on September 21st in Chicago. And uh, it seems that every year there's controversy surrounding my placement. One year I'm second in the world by comparison to somebody that's 50 pounds heavier and five inches taller. And the next minute uh, I'm getting fourth in the world. Um, third behind, or th three places behind guys that are just bigger than me too. I get letters every day um, and read articles every day about people being frustrated with the current trend in bodybuilding in that they've gotten away from what bodybuilding is all about. Bodybuilding is, also, is about building muscle and size, there's no question. But to the exclusion of symmetry, proportion, definition, presentation, and all the things that they say they judge on, isn't fair and I seem to be coming up short on all scorecards when you take in the other factors besides just enormous mass right now. Sean was self-made for the most part of his career. After John Brown moved to Europe to focus on his own career, Sean was left to learn the business and the science of bodybuilding on his own. That independence gave him an edge and confidence where nobody could tell him what to do or say. This was a quality that Joe Weider loved about Sean. At the 1996 Olympia, Sean came in the biggest he had ever been and brought arguably the most complete physique to the stage that year, despite being noticeably smaller than the rest of the final lineup. He maintained his signature lines and aesthetics despite the added size. He also came in rocking a bald head, I think to make him a little more aerodynamic on his squats. And once again, Sean outdid himself. His package that year was good enough to put him in the final two against, you guessed it, his good old buddy Dorian. In a legendary match, Sean fought hard and came close, but in the end, the shadow size was far too overwhelming, and he would win his sixth standout. Sean had been growing very resentful of the judging and apparent favoritism towards Dorian. He had just experienced what felt to him like a second screw job, and he was not quiet about it. In the 96 Olympia that we just discussed, Sean had noticed backstage that Dorian was receiving what he believed to be special treatment from head judge Steve Weinberger and other show organizers. The Olympia that year was not allowing any non-bodybuilders backstage, so the athletes were left to prepare themselves. According to Sean, head judge Steve Weinberger was helping Dorian Yates with his oil and not any of the other athletes, which would objectively be unfair based on the rules. 
Being the top dog in many sports often gets you special treatment, so the morality of that is for you to decide. Sean voiced his displeasure to Big Steve, and let's just say it did not go well. Politics have been a pretty big stigma in the bodybuilding community for a while, and have objectively devalued the sport in a lot of ways. Bumping elbows with the right people has always had its advantages, but Sean never had an interest in doing any of that. Instead, he wanted better for the athletes and was willing to fight for it. He had been a very vocal advocate for change within bodybuilding, even going as far as calling himself, ready for this? The Martin Luther King of bodybuilding at that time. Make of that what you will. Among many of his gripes was the judging, and the fact that the IFBB had the same 12 judges judging for the last decade. With bodybuilding being a subjective sport, if you have the same people judging every year, they're likely to favor the same types of physiques, and that's exactly what happened. Many athletes kept their mouths shut in an effort to stay in the favor of the judges. Sean didn't really care, as he felt that putting your neck on the line to better the sport for the athletes was worth more than individual achievement. To Sean, it was bigger than bodybuilding. His efforts helped institute the practice of individual mandatory posing before comparisons during prejudging. This is the practice of having competitors pose for the judges individually before getting compared to the competition. This allows the judges to get a look at every competitor at their best which also allows them to be able to organize the most accurate and fair callouts based on those initial routines. This began at the 1997 Olympia and is still in practice to this day. I think I speak for a lot of competitors when I say that this was a very welcome change. I haven't been able to definitively confirm the amount of influence that Sean had on that change, but I do know that he was involved to some capacity. What also happened at the 1997 Olympia were Sean's sentiments being validated about the judging. Dorian Yates brought what was objectively his worst package in his championship run. I mean, he did not look great. He was bloated, spilling over, and had torn his left bicep and tricep before the show. Two injuries which were very apparent. In his most controversial Olympia victory, he not only defeated Nasser El Sabadi, but somehow beat him with perfect scores. Remember. Winning in bodybuilding is about who has the least number of flaws, and that competitor was objectively Nasser. In Sean's opinion, the judges being ignorant to the consequences of rewarding flaws was a factor in the decline in the quality of the sport. Sean was an absolute menace. The 97 Olympia was also the year that he fabricated the rumor that Flex Wheeler had calf implants as a means of psychological warfare. This led Flex to fabricating the infamous ninja story, but that's for another video. The year is 2001, and the setting is the Mr. Olympia press conference. Sean is taking the opportunity to address his frustrations. When hearing that, we can actually see the individual scores from the judges, because the, the paper that we are handed out, and actually the general public gets as well, is only the total score. There is no individual judges with their names next to their scores that any of the athletes have seen. It was 1988 or 1989, somewhere in there. I've been in 11 Mr. Olympias. And I've yet to see that type of a format ever since. And this is the first time I'm hearing that we can actually go to Wayne D'Amelia and get that piece of paper because it's never been offered. That being said, I don't think that we should have to go to the IFBB president to get a piece of paper that he already has to find out the individual scores from the judges and have a press conference because all of you guys complain when it's all over and done and Ronnie's got the trophy and he's gone. And I don't like hearing it. I'm tired of hearing it. This is the form because your input changes things. And if we hear it loud and clear and stop sitting there being afraid to ask that question, Wayne's here for this reason. We're here for this reason. You know, last year. We haven't made any progress. There's nothing changing with the judges. Yeah, we have 22 judges that are in rotation, but nobody's asked the question out of those 22 judges, how many judges judged us last year that will be judging us this year? That's a very important question to know. How many of those judges that judged me last year will be judging me this year? That's important to know. Whether we have 58 judges, 22 judges, or 12. If there's seven of them judging me again in the consecutive year, then what have we accomplished? We haven't done anything. So those are this press conference was infamous for not just Sean's brazen jabs at the judges, but also for what reigning champ Ronnie Coleman's response was to how Sean felt. 
We don't live in a perfect society. Nothing's never going to be perfect. Uh, from day one, we've been battling over this and battling over that. Nobody's ever liked everything somebody else has ever liked. I don't like ice cream. Bob don't like ice cream. Susie does. I don't like apples, and John don't like oranges. I don't like oranges either. It's always going to be a problem. In 1992, I didn't place at all in the Olympia. Didn't get a dime. Didn't get a dollar. I didn't complain. 1994, I didn't complain when I got 15. 1995, I didn't complain when I got 11. 1996, I didn't complain when I got six. 1997, I didn't complain when I got ninth. The, the, the moral to the story is, why complain? <laughs> I'm three times Mr. Olympia. How many times have you won? This hilarious rebuttal by Ronnie brought an entertaining level of verbal jousting that the press conferences have always been known for. From a fan perspective, it was great to see. The big Rottweiler Ronnie squashing the seemingly whiny chihuahua that was Sean Ray. It was gold. But here's the thing. Behind Ronnie's demeaning comments to Sean was the reality of Sean's fight for overall improvement within the IFBB. He was kind of alone. Because when you're a multiple time Olympia champ like Ronnie was, you have nothing to really complain about. The flaws in the judging don't really matter to you, nor are they even apparent to you when you're in first place. And as far as you're concerned, the judges are doing a fantastic job. You come back to me that, that just because I'm Mr. Olympian, I've won three times in a row, that something's wrong with the judges. You're taking I could just see something wrong with y'all's body. You're taking a personal. <laughs> Okay, as I'm editing this video, I'm skimming through this 2001 press conference and uh, finding the footage that I want to add. And I knew that Ronnie had gone off on the competitors, but I had no idea how bad he violated them. I mean, God damn it, Ronnie, you humongous savage. This exchange with Ronnie was not the only event this press conference was famous for. There was a judge who critiqued Sean's physique, claiming that his appearance hadn't changed in 10 years. The egregious problem with this statement is that a judge who was supposed to be fair and had not yet seen his physique, was already assuming that he hadn't changed. I need to do that, Deshay. Okay, so why don't you do that? Because that's what we're here for. Listen, we're I don't... here to better yourself because you come in in the same every year. You don't that's change. That's your opinion, and this is you your first change. Mr. Olympia that you're judging. Whether I change Yeah, but I've judged the Arnold twice. I've judged the Iron Man. I've yeah. got 20 years of experience. Okay. Can I say something? This kind of statement at a post-competition press conference could have passed as just a subjective opinion based on an observation. But making that statement before the competition gave it a hint of overt bias. Not to mention, Sean's physique had absolutely changed and improved in the last 10 years. Any objective person could see that. Sean wasn't having any of this, and he clapped back accordingly. It's what good does it do to Shay? It gives us peace of mind after training five months on a low carb diet, doing cardio two to four hours a day, having our friendships, breaking our relationships, and doing our job. At the end of the day, if I can see that the judges also did their job, there's a little bit more accountability there. And I do hold the flag for a lot of the smaller bodybuilders, but when I have a judge tell me to my face the night, the night before she judges me, you haven't changed in 12 years, and she's gonna turn around and judge me, how do you think I take that? Whoa! And before I'm done with this sport in terms of making a change or at least having some kind of influence for the people coming up behind me, because there's nothing to shade that the judges can do to me that they haven't already done. This judge was then rightfully dismissed. This incident further validated Sean's gripe with the judges and overall judging in the IFBB. But wait, there's more. That year, Wayne D'Amelio allowed Kevin Laveroni to compete. The problem with this was that he did not renew his IFBB Pro card which is a yearly requirement to compete at the pro level. He also did not sign the Olympia contract, which was a requirement to compete at the Olympia. 
Wayne allowed Kevin to compete anyways, even though he shouldn't have been. This incident further validated Sean's career-long gripe with Wayne D'Amelia, who he felt was a dictator, and a guy who wanted everything to be done his way or the highway. But wait, there's more. At this time, bodybuilding legend Jay Cutler was competing in his second Olympia, and had made the impressive jump to second place from his eighth place finish the year prior. After that year's Olympia, he had tested positive for a banned diuretic along with Marcus Rule. The IFBB launched a meticulous investigation around the circumstances of those drug tests before finalizing any disqualifications. What they discovered was that the lab conducting the test did everything correctly at the event and all protocols were followed. However, that lab was no longer officially accredited by the International Olympic Committee, whose drug testing standards and regimens the IFBB had been following years prior. So because this lab was no longer accredited by the IOC, the IFBB decided to declare the failed test of Jay Cutler and Marcus Rule null and void, essentially allowing their placings to stand on a technicality, which Wayne D'Amelio would admit in an official statement. So, this meant that Jay Cutler and Kevin Lavroni would remain in second and third place respectively, with Sean taking fourth place. This didn't sit well with Sean, as he could have been in second place had the rules been enforced. According to Sean, taking second place that year would have guaranteed his return to the Olympia in 2002. Having just been screwed over yet again, Sean had to watch the rules be disregarded in favor of politics. After these events, Sean had to really consider whether the amount of time he was putting into bodybuilding as well as the wear and tear on his body, was worth everything he was missing out on that deep down inside he really wanted. In his final five Olympias, Sean would place third, fifth, sixth, fourth, and fourth. Many have said that Sean's last appearance on stage marked the end of the golden era of bodybuilding, as he was the last true classic physique in open bodybuilding. In the words of Sean, uh, now, not, that's not taking anything away from Dorian, but what I will take away from it is that the beauty of bodybuilding was lost when the 90s expired. Because After the 2001 Olympia, Sean decided to take a year off from bodybuilding and take the 2002 season off. That year allowed him to explore life away from the stage and training just for the fun of training, as well as explore his post-bodybuilding career. Sean made the decision to run for athlete's representative a position he felt the IFPB really needed. He ran on the platform of transparency, proper monetary distribution, and of course, judging reform. This aspiration was not well received by his good old buddy Wayne, who believed that an athlete's rep would not be good for the organization. But Sean was given the position regardless. This tenure wouldn't last though. In 2003, he quit due to the other athletes within the organization not willing to stand up and back him in his effort to bring legitimate reform. Sean believed that athletes could have done a better job of representing each other, especially the athletes who have the power and the platform to be taken seriously, athletes like Ronnie Coleman. There was honestly no point in going to battle for people who just weren't willing to fight. Sean's one year off turned into two years and he would get married to his wife Christy in 2003. In 2004, the Weeders sold their company to American Media Inc., also known as AMI. That same year, Sean got a major supplement deal with Van Nuys-based supplement company Biotech Nutritionals. That supplement deal was paying him double what he was getting with his contract from the Weeders. This deal, according to Sean, gave him a reason to never step on stage again. Having made a pretty lucrative and overall successful transition from bodybuilding, Sean could focus on his new business ventures while also building his new family with his newlywed wife, Christy, which is exactly what he did. In 2005, Sean and Christy welcomed their first child, Asia Monet Ray, who, in a simple Google search, revealed to me that she is significantly more famous than her old man, so clearly the talent was passed down. She even got her own reality show called Raising Asia, which only lasted a season, but still, a reality show was pretty dope. With the direction that the IFU was heading in, Sean's physique was ultimately left behind. What made him so good in his prime didn't really matter anymore at the time of his retirement. 
The sport was simply getting bigger than what his genetic capability and age would allow. As he would say, his physique was five years too late. He blossomed at a time when God-given genetics was the main factor in one's success, with anabolics only supplementing that. His willingness to speak his mind behind the scenes as time went on spoke to his growing frustration with the organization, an organization he no longer felt he had a place in. It's possible that his constant critique of the judges led to him being overlooked, especially in the back half of his career, but we can only speculate about that. Sean ultimately made the right decision to move on and focus on other things. In retrospect, it's very hard to see a path or scenario where he would have ended up champion. He came up short in his best two attempts and arguably got robbed in one of them. Regardless, bodybuilding is a subjective sport and it's filled with shoulda, coulda, wouldas. And despite never having lifted a sandow, he doesn't lose any sleep over it. Not only has Sugar Sean Ray rightfully earned his place as a legend in bodybuilding, but he's also earned his place as an uncrowned Mr. Olympia, one of the best uncrowned Mr. Olympias. Now, while most bodybuilders retire and focus on other things and kind of fade into irrelevance, Sean was all about the spotlight. One thing he maintained even in retirement was his big ass mouth. And to all of his haters who hated the fact that he was vocal before, oh, they hadn't seen anything yet. If Sean Ray the competitor was somewhat of a loudmouth menace, well, Sean Ray, the retiree and Hall of Famer, would become one of bodybuilding's biggest villains. Stay tuned for part two. Hey, if you made it to the end of this video, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. Uh, my name is Large Coffee. I'm an amateur competitor and passionate bodybuilding lover and overall fitness enthusiast. And I've always had a passion for media arts and content creation, but I've never really found how I wanted to express that and that's kind of what this channel is all about and I think bodybuilding is making an incredible comeback and I just feel really honored to be a part of that and I want to stay a part of that and allow this channel to grow as bodybuilding continues to grow as well um, Sean Ray specifically has been a pretty polarizing figure throughout bodybuilding um, specifically in his retirement but lately he's gotten um, caught up in a lot of controversy and I wanted him to be the subject of my first video because as new people start to get into the bodybuilding scene, um, they may not know who Sean is. They may not know kind of his rise to bodybuilding. They may not know everything about him prior to all the controversy. And I wanted to create a video about him specifically. And this is just part one of a two part series that I'll be doing on Sean, where in part two, we're going to cover everything else that I mentioned at the end of the video. Now, Doing the research for this video was a very interesting process. So I was initially going to call this video the controversial legacy of Sean Ray because initially I wanted to make a case for how controversial he's been his whole career and recency bias kind of put me in a place where I just assumed he was always controversial and in my research I kind of realized that just wasn't the case. I couldn't make a concrete case for him being this ultra controversial person his entire career really and he himself admitted this he didn't become controversial until he retired it wasn't until that 2001 press conference where he really got that label prior to that he wasn't really any different than the other athletes i mean besides complaining about some unfair placings which every bodybuilder does he wasn't really all that controversial so i didn't really feel comfortable calling it the controversial legacy really just a more complicated legacy because his legacy isn't so black and white so it's been a couple years since i actually edited a video and this video actually came out a lot longer than i anticipated but i wanted to include as much detail as possible um just so it can be thorough and the editing process definitely took two inches off my hairline but you know what if I can keep making content like this and enjoy it the way I enjoyed making this video, I will gladly let my hairline recede. You know, I got into kind of the history of bodybuilding from watching Nick Strength and Power. And honestly, I learned a lot about bodybuilding history through his channel. And I watched him grow significantly 
and he's been a huge inspiration to me. So I kind of wanted to take what Nick did in terms of teaching me about bodybuilding history and kind of elevate it to another level. And I hope I was able to do that in this video. To be quite honest, I don't completely agree with everything that Sean says, but at the same time, I don't completely disagree with everything. Um, the Sean Roden issue is something that did leave a bad taste in my mouth, and that's something that I will be covering in depth in the next video. But oh no, I just really wanted to make the point that Sean was more complicated and is more complicated than anything. I have some very unique projects that I absolutely cannot wait to get started on, and I can't wait to put that out. Um, if you like this video, I really encourage you to keep watching, hit all those buttons that you're encouraged to hit, and um, check out my Instagram for my personal prep um, updates. I'm getting ready for a competition myself, and if you want to see my journey and um, how I'm getting there, I definitely encourage you to go check out the Instagram, um, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.